Uh, welcome to the foundation in IIT Nursing. Today we are going to discuss on the risk nursing issues that is one of the important topics in IIT care. Uh, we do have our faculty and facilitator join here with us in the session uh, for today. Ms. Nehalada Suryakshan uh, and our facilitator Ms. Shiva RS. Without my further, further delay having over for uh, further session facilitation to Shiva ma'am. Over to you ma'am. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon to all. Happy to see you again. Uh, today we are going to learn about basic nursing issues. So we all know uh, that we are nurses, but still we need to take uh, our uh, knowledge. Uh, today, Ms. Uh, Nehra Sudesh uh, joined with this. Uh, she is a uh, faculty today. She is an nursing nurse, uh, specialized in community health nursing. She did her uh, certificate course in ballet to nursing from Bali, India. Uh, and uh, now she is working as a uh, staff nurse in the Valley of India. And also, uh, she is a uh, teaching faculty. Uh, she has uh, six years of experience in program with uh, She has a former nursing expert called as Nursing Jaipur. She has contributed a book, uh, the chapter in the book uh, titled Nursing Education and Technology. And also, she has published a research article in the uh, Journal of Molecular uh, and Clinical Medication. Medicine, sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay, so. Uh, as the ma'am has introduced uh, regard, uh, my name, so I would like to repeat my name. My name is Nehlata Sudeshan. So I will be uh, facilitating, uh, sorry, uh, taking the topic basic nursing issues. So, uh, or the basic nursing care of bedridden patients, right? Um, okay, so uh, what do you think? What do you think? What are the principles that will be involved in caring of a bedridden patient? So in our clinical, like we are all nurses, we know that uh, in our setting, we are uh, dealing with the patients who are semi-conscious, who are completely bedridden, uh, paraplegic patients. Uh, and uh, there are many patients who are like because of that, they are bedridden. So what what all are the uh, like principles which we have to keep in mind while caring for a bedridden patient? So I would like everyone to use the chat box or you can uh, um, unmute yourself and uh, answer, uh, like contribute your answers. So what do you think? What are the principles uh, in caring for a bedridden patient? So I would like uh, to get answers from your end. It's already displayed, I know, but still I would like to uh, get answers from your end. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. To prevent bed sore. Okay. To prevent bed sore. Okay. Thank you for your response. I would like more response from your side. <coughs> prevent for fall. Okay. History of fall. Prevent bed sore. Okay. Prevent all the complications. Exercise. Positioning patients and giving back care at times. Okay. Prevent thank you. all the complications. Okay. Like bed sores and isolation, everything. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any anything else you want to contribute? We have to encourage the patient. First, confidence. We we'll have to give the confidence to patient to stay in the bed. That is very uncomfortable feeling. Okay. We have, to re we have to reassure the patients and we have to reduce the anxiety and the stress of the patients. Mainly uh, reduce, prevent isolation, right? So yeah. when the patient become bedridden, we have to prevent isolation. So we have to use strategies to prevent isolation. Okay. Thank you for your answers. Um, Okay, so the principles that are involved in caring for a bedridden patient first is prevent health complication as you have already contributed the answers that the health related complications uh, we have to prevent it like if the patient is uh, like bedridden and the patient has occurred bed sore 
okay or uh, any history of like health related complications they are they are already dealing with so in order to uh, prevent more complications we are following the basic principles so we can provide comfort so these uh, we need to provide comfort to the patient right so how how we can provide comfort to the patient for a bedridden patient providing good bed without wrinkles good bed without wrinkles yes okay position change changing the position okay and some we can apply some mattress intermittent very good assistive devices right we can use assistive devices like air bed water bed which is comfortable for the patient and yeah cushions for the yeah patient. yeah okay so the, we have to promote con uh, in order to promote the con con comfort and also build confidence so when we can prevent the health complication we will provide comfort to the patient automatically the patient will develop confidence their confidence level will be increased like if a patient is a uh, paraplegic patient right so uh, when patient uh, like we can help the patient by uh, uh, pro uh, providing education to the caregiver that whatever minimum uh, things that patient can do by himself, we have to promote that, right? So by promoting that, you know, like everything the caregiver is doing, that is not needed. Even the patient is bedridden, if he is able to do certain activities of his daily life, we can promote that. So by promoting that, the patient will develop confidence right then prevent isolation so when the patient become bedridden he will be completely emotionally down right so when he will be emotionally down he will be in isolated in one area he won't be talking to anyone uh, more frequently right so what we can do is we can uh, by following the these principle we can also prevent the isolation like when they are contributing uh, their own things to, of daily activity they are building confidence so we can prevent automatically prevent the isolation also right they won't be neglected they can contribute their own activities in their daily life then if we are doing uh, following these all protocols then we can improve the quality of life of the patient isn't it yes or no I want response. Yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So we know that what are the basic needs of a patient. So when we are mainly in palliative care, we are focusing main on the basic needs of the patient, right? So what are the basic needs of the patient? Yeah. What are the basic needs? Hygiene. Okay. Skin care, bandage, yeah. bath, infection, mat. Okay, to prevent Nutrition. infection. Okay, so basic needs means what are the basic needs? Like we all a human being has basic need, uh, needs like we want shelter, we want food to eat, we want water to drink, we want uh, like uh, clothing to wear, right? So these are all our as a human being basic needs. So when the patient uh, becomes bedridden or when when the disease attacks a patient we all have to uh, provide basic needs uh, we have to fulfill the basic needs of the patient so what all are that that is head to toe care right head to toe care we have to provide so what are the head to toe care we basically we focus Morning on care. yeah physical examination of the patient no basic care i'm saying basic care what are the basic cares that is it, it's already morning Morning care position changing. Oral, um, oral care to oral care and Very good. Care. That is from head to toe care. From head, head to toe start from the head, head hair care, right? Head care, hair care, eye care, ear care, mouth yeah. care, Everything. skin care, right? Perineal. Perineal care, nail care. These all are the basic cares a patient needs, right? So, uh, so we'll look for one or one to one point. We will uh, uh, like we will contribute our points, and I will also contribute few points so that uh, we will get a, a bulk of knowledge about that. So first we will look into the oral care, right? Okay, oral care, overall health. Why? These are all general. I know you are more uh, like more familiar with these. Your everyday experience are there by giving oral care, right? 
right so it's just a discussion we are i am not um, like for teaching big big points it's just a discussion and we are just polishing your knowledge basic knowledge so oral care why it is overall health we need to uh, keep the patient free infection from mouth infection. yeah infection okay so prevent from like in order to promote oral hygiene right in order to promote the oral hygiene so oral hygiene basically how many times you have to give no times not less than two times right so uh, uh, even if it is a bedridden patient not less than two times so some uh, jusen has said because it may be affected patient's appetite too yeah we can promote appetite we can improve the nutrition we can uh, pro uh, prevent uh, like pr promote hygiene okay so thank you for your response so we'll look into the oral care um, it's an overall health okay so what is the purpose what is the purpose of oral care already we have discussed few points have been in the chat box so we'll discuss it to prevent the infection okay so yeah so mouth is an excellent incubator of bacteria uh, growth of bacteria why why it is said like this it is an excellent incubator of growth of bacteria renuka ma'am please unmute uh, and we are not able to uh, sorry i uh, mean it's we can the, the food particles can collect into the some caries and some places uh, around the teeth and Uh, can uh, have some uh, infection risk and other than that mucosal some oral trust like something yeah yeah thank you thank you ma'am so mouth is an excellent incubator of bacteria growth of bacteria that means we chew food with our mouth right so whenever we chew a food the particles will be uh, retained in our mouth so in order to remove that uh, food particles or plague for uh, plagues we have to uh, uh, like we have to promote hygiene mouth care right so um, so hygiene uh, practices help to maintain healthy status of the mouth teeth and gums okay so hygiene practice can promote good health condition to the mouth teeth and gums and even lips and remove food particles that may be likely medium for the bacterial growth if the food particles remains in the mouth then what will happen it will be uh, more uh, make a favorable environment for the microorganism to grow so in order to remove that all we are the mainly focusing on mouth care then it keeps the lip and mucosa soft clean intact and moist so the lips and the mucosal area of um, mucosal lining will be soft clean and intact and moist and it also promote comfort right so these are the purpose like uh, uh, one of you among has the chat box i said that it promotes nutritional by enhancing appetite right improves nutrition it stimulate the blood circulation of the gum thus maintaining healthy firmness so whenever we provide a good uh, oral care the uh, gum circulation and the um, uh, overall mouth circulation can be improved then eliminates the source of unpleasant odor yes the, this should be the first point right so whenever we get up early morning we do brushing we brush our teeth even we teach our kids also right so why we we in order to prevent the eliminate the unpleasant odor so whenever the patient become more bedridden or if it the patient is in rails to pee, feeding or uh, uh, the mouth is open and the patient is breathing with the mouth so mouth will become dry right so at that condition if that uh, negligence will be there then it can lead to bad odor smell also right so we have to so while giving a oral care we can eliminate the uh, unpleasant odor and also it prevents from dental caries right so what all are the common oral problems dental caries gingivitis mm, okay thank you More? gum infection mm. gum infection ma'am Yeah, oral thrush. Okay. Halitosis. Halitosis. Bad breath. Yes. Mucositis. Gingivitis. Oral thrush. Gingivitis. Okay. Yeah. Dryness yeah. of the mouth. Dryness of the mouth. What is that called? Gingivitis. Dryness of the mouth or mucous yeah. membrane of the mouth. Xerostomia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, a uh, few answers are there in the chat chat box also. Uh, fungal infection, ulcer, halitosis. Yeah. 
Okay, so we'll look into the oral problems, common oral problems. Okay, dry mouth, painful mouth, halitosis, that is bad, uh, foul smelling, breath, candidiasis infection, you know, uh, that will lead to oral thrush, that is white patches will be there, curled like patch, curled color like patches. Then oral mucocytosis, that is inflammation of the mucous membrane. Then alteration in the taste. These are the common problems. And uh, we know that in palliative care, what are uh, the opioids we are using that will be causing more dry mouth, right? So more uh, dry mouth will be most uh, frequent side effect that will be causing. So we have to mainly focus on the oral care also when the patient is uh, like it is uh, like we have to promote oral care if the patient is bedridden, unconscious or uh, or uh, even if the patient's health condition is deteriorated, we have to promote oral care. Right, and excessive salivation. Okay. So we will, uh, as the image is given, zero stomia, that is uh, dryness of the mouth, mucous membrane, candidial infection, that is white patches will be there, uh, that is seen in the tongue and the upper palate because of candidial albicans infection, fungal infection. Next. Hmm? Then halitosis, that is all smelling breath and mucocytosis that is inflammation of the mucous membrane of the mouth so um, so uh, you have you seen these cases i think yes right yes ma'am yeah only one response yes yes ma'am okay ma'am okay who needs mouth care so we have discussed already. We have said the points. So just, uh, just better contribute your patients. points. Okay, better than patients, elderly patients and children having NG tube. Okay, very good. I think everybody needs okay. oral surgery. Okay, one answer is uh, uh, like everybody needs oral care. Yeah, uh, yes, of course, everybody needs, but we have to focus on the bedridden patients, unconscious patients, the patient who have RT feed. Okay, or the patient uh, who like if the patient is unconscious, they will be opening their mouth and breathing through the mouth. So they are uh, these all patients are more uh, in need of oral care, right? Okay, terminally ill patient. Okay, so these are the terms which we have to remember it. We know in general the terms we use, but terminally ill patients, terminally ill patient means because of uh, disease condition, they are completely bed bound. Okay, and uh, unconscious patient, as you have said, patient breathing through the mouth, post-operative patients, patient with infections and diseases of the mouth, patients on NG tube feeding. Okay. Okay, so what are the assessments? While we do a oral care, before that we have to do an assessment. So what will be the assessments? Yeah, contribute your points. Halitosis. Zerostemia. Okay, Candidates. condition of the mouth. Lakshmi is saying condition of the mouth. Yeah. So in the condition of the mouth, what you what you will see? What you will assess? Dryness. Dryness. Crack lips. Quantity yeah. of saliva. Okay. Crack lips. Dry lips. Any kind of condition of gum. Okay. Inflammation. Patches. Yeah. Is there any? Any ulcer is there? Yeah. Redness is there, any patches, very good. Yeah, okay. So these are all the things we have to assess. Okay, so cracked lip. Okay, so we have to check the lips are cracked or not. We have to check for the angle of the lips also because more frequently that uh, angle of the uh, lips become um, chilosis. Chilosis will be there, right? Angle of the uh, uh, lips will be cracked. Then dry and coated tongue white curd like patches in order to uh, oh, uh, figure out it is a candidate infection or not then ulcer in the mouth 
any redness or bleeding bleeding is there or not then any pain in the mouth if pain patient is responding respond giving response we can uh, check the assess this dysphagia difficulty in swallowing any taste alteration okay any kind of anorexia uh, like loss of appetite because of oral hygiene is improper uh, is not there or oral hygiene is not uh, met so we have to look for the unpleasant uh, like anorexia okay and uh, medications or because of any kind of medication the dryness of mouth is there so we have to assess there if patient is taking certain opioid medication which can lead to side effect as dry mouth and also treatment conditions because of that okay then solutions used for the mouth care so what are the solutions which we basically use for oral care we use Plain water. Plain water, okay. Plain. Again, permanent water. Cayman of four. Water. Water. Hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide will mm. uh, uh, Mom, soda bicarbonate. Soda bicarbonate, yes. Hydrogen peroxide, where where it is used? Hydrogen peroxide? I don't no. think oh, so. Oh, no, it, it can feed injured. Mouth. Yeah, it will cause mucosal irritation. We will not yes. use hydrogen peroxide, right? So, maybe the way, salt gargle. Salt normal, gargle. Okay, normal, so with salt, salt gargling, gargle. we can, yeah, with normal salt. Uh, yeah, yeah, better in yes. Okay, in so normal. how you will prepare the home care solution, normal saline? Yeah, how you will prepare normal saline solution at home? So basically, the patients are from uh, like we have to provide home care to the patient. So how you will suggest to make a, a normal homemade saline? Mm -hmm. Yeah, salt and water. Warm water added from salt and put one pinch of salt. Okay. For like lukewarm, then you can use. Okay. Mm. Okay. So solution used for the mouth will be water or 0.9% sodium chloride. Okay. Homemade saline. So how we will prepare it? Preparation of the saline solution will be we will take 500 ml of water plus one teaspoon of common salt. We will boil it, cool it, and keep it covered until needed. Okay, so whenever we need it, we can do this procedure. What, what is the procedure? We will take 500 ml of water, we will add one teaspoon of common salt, and then we will boil it, cool it, and keep it covered and uh, take it as needed. Then and the other option is soda bicarb. Soda bicarb, how we'll prepare? Preparing the soda bicarb solution, 500 ml water plus one fourth of teaspoon of baking soda. Okay, so we can uh, mix both also, like uh, whenever we are uh, going for a patient. So we can take one glass of water, a pinch of salt, a pinch of soda bicarb, right? So we can uh, do oral care with that also, right? So these are the solution used for the oral care. So what are the self-care education? So self-care education will be the brush the teeth twice a day as we have discussed and we have to use soft bristle toothbrush. So when it is a bedridden patient, so how we will provide a oral care for a bedridden patient? We can't use the soft bristle brush. Use some ghost paste. Ghost paste and artery forceps. With Go the artery forceps. Artery forceps. Okay, swab stick. Uh, okay. Gauze with spatula, okay. So, uh, like if the patient is unconscious, okay, unconscious. So, how you will open the mouth and do oral care? We have to use the tongue dipper. Okay, so in the home setting, we don't have tongue depressor. Then mm. we can use our finger. Finger of accidentally, spoon, the patient will bite your finger. That time, spoon, spoon, ma'am. Okay, spoon, the spoon spoon handle part. The spoon's handle part has to be covered with spatula, the spatula. spatula. Okay, and we have to open it with one spoon, then another spoon we can clean it, right? So this procedure we will show it in the video, right? So it will be more clear for you. Then toothpaste left in the mouth can cause 
dryness okay so we have to even remember that whenever we are using a toothpaste and a brush so we have to look for any kind of leftover toothpaste other if the leftover tooth, uh, toothpaste will be there then it can cause dryness right then also yeah. rinse the mouth with the homemade saline or soda bicarb solution tongue to be brushed with soft br uh, toothbrush so if we are using a toothbrush we can use uh, we can clean the that soft bristles can be used to clean the tongue also but when we are not using a toothbrush we can use a uh, like uh, as suggested uh, like a small uh, um, what spoons uh, on the handle part right handle part with the gauze we can clean that area okay and we have to give plenty of water to drink we are we can suggest the patient to take plenty of water and also pineapple pineapple we can give the patient to eat pineapple why because pineapple has a mouth cleansing enzyme that enzyme will stimulate the salivary gland so uh, however it is uh, acidic but these are not suggest for for the patient who has mouth ulcers because it will irritate so we can give pineapple also and dentures uh, should be removed at night and we have to suggest the patient if they are they are using dentures we can uh, suggest them to remove at night and place it in a solution or a water okay and whenever morning they are using it it has, it has to be clean completely properly clean and then their that dentures has been reused right Okay, so this uh, procedure for a patient requiring assistance, right? So what will the procedure? So whenever we go for a procedure, what we will do to the patient? What we will say to the patient? Whenever we go for a procedure. Explain the procedure to the patient. Explain the procedure to the patient. Then? Get the consent. Oral care consent is not necessary. We can only tell them that we are providing oral care. Consent is needed only for a surgical procedure if you are doing it, right? So any invasive procedure needs a consent. So privacy, we have to ensure privacy, right? Then we have to provide semi-follows position, position or comfortable position. So semi-follows and follows will be more good. Otherwise, we can, if it's an unconscious patient, we can uh, like elevate the bed and uh, to 30 degree right then place a towel under the chin and over uh, and over the bedding in order to prevent uh, spilling of the uh, liquid then pour the water over the brush and place dentifrice on it right so this is for the patient who can do it right okay some uh, Phil Filippo has said what is the question uh, let explain the procedure then position yes Okay, so that is, we have to explain the procedure to the patient. We have to provide privacy, semi-follows or follows position. If not contraindicated, we have to use the towel in the in the chin area and the bedding and also pour the water to the breast and place the dentifrice on it, right? Right, so next. Then encourage the patient to rinse the mouth uh, frequently. Otherwise, what will happen? If the patient is not rinsing them out properly, then what will happen? Already explain one point. It will be irritating. It will be left over the paste or whatever very solution. Good. It will irritate. Very good. Very good. So leftover toothpaste will be causing dryness. So we have to encourage the patient to rinse the mouth properly, frequently, and remove and clean the equipment, wash your hands, and finally, after the procedure, what we have to do? Finally, after, uh, okay, everything we have done. We have done the procedure. Finally, we have to document it. Document, very good. We have to document the time, the solution use, and the condition of the oral cavity. What all findings you have before assessing and after that, after the procedure, what all assessment you have done or what, what is the condition of the oral cavity finally. It is clean or not or what all. If you are doing the brushing and any kind of bleeding is there, you have to note it down, right? So these all things you have to carry now uh, have to do the while we are doing a procedure okay procedure for a terminally ill patient then if it is a hospital setting or if it is a home setting then then hospital setting artery forcep tongue depressor gauze piece normal saline small macintosh face towel clean water swab sticks and kidney tray so these all things will be available in the hospital setting so what we will do 
if, if we have to do a, a like oral care in the home care setting we will need we will need a spoon or a ice cream stick clean cotton uh, cloth or a gauze piece homemade saline plastic sheet face towel clean water swab stick and kidney tray right so how we will make homemade saline what is education will you, you will give how to make an homemade saline we can add a pinch of water um, salt and a pinch of baking soda in the water if it is a one glass of water so if it is a 500 ml because every time they can't make it na so what we will do water will be lukewarm whatever water we are using for oral care that will be lukewarm right then uh, home care setting if you are doing then how much amount of water 500 500 ml and 1 soda bhai ka 1 pinch of salt okay 1/4 1/4 on baking soda 1/4 of baking soda so okay 500 ml of water plus 1 teaspoon uh, salt if we are baking a salt water right and if it is a bicarbonate then what we have to do 500 ml of water plus 1/4 of soda bhai ka baking yeah. soda so and what i said about the glass of water is the glass of water will be like when we are giving an oral care for single patient or a group of patient right so in the hospital we have got lukewarm water so we can take in a glass of water more large quantity of water is not needed so we can take a glass of water a pinch of salt and pinch of bicarb can be added right so in home care setting it doesn't uh, like patient will not have uh, soda bicarb so we can suggest as for a salt if patient doesn't have small only baking soda is there he adjusted from one of the neighbor so we can use that right okay so in the terminally ill uh, patient also we have to explain the procedure to the patient because they will be a little bit hearing then provide privacy small macintosh with a face or a towel under the head semi follows position and head turned towards the side why we are turning the head towards the side prevent aspiration Okay. aspiration can aspiration use a tongue blade uh, to open the mouth and separate the upper and the lower teeth then soak the cotton balls in homemade saline and squeeze it and then we are squeezing to uh, remove the excess water then we have to clean the teeth that is how we will clean the teeth we will clean the lower chewing surface inner and the outer then upper surface chewing surface inner and outer then clean the oral cavity from the proximal to the distal and using one gauze piece for each stroke whenever we are this is very important point whenever we, we are giving an oral care we have to use one gauze piece for each stroke when we stroke means if we are using an upper lower surface of the chewing surface we will lower surface will be cleaned from one end to the other end in a single stroke with using one cotton right then clean with the normal water lubricate lips using swab stick document the time solution use condition of the oral cavity any abnormality notice and the patient's response patient is responding he will be say what we he will say finally after the oral care he will be happy he will be saying at least once you will go after the oral care he will have his his breakfast and he will say that today i had a taste in my mouth right did you experience such kind of things yes yeah only one only renuka has experienced renuka ma'am only experienced this thing no one other yes okay few answers in the chat box yeah okay okay rest rest participants have not uh, have an experience yeah okay okay it's coming yeah okay thank you for your response uh, okay um, so i think this much is clear any doubts okay okay so the common lubricants what are the common lubricants we are using like if it's a cracked lip we can use liquid paraffin coconut oil ghee oil or vaseline right glycerin yeah okay so we will see how to care for a uh, like uh, how to do an oral care procedure after watching it will be more clear right so how to do a oral care so i would like to get response from you 
uh, what is the take home take home message you have got from this video or any new thing which you have uh, learned from this video yeah So I would like to get response. Just introduce ourselves to the patient and also the procedure, what we are going to do and make the patient comfortable and also in the position, make the patient in a comfortable position. <clears throat> Thank you. More response. Suraya, uh, yeah. Explaining procedure to the attendant also. Uh, okay. So we are like parallelly doing an uh, education. Okay. We are providing edu health education to the uh, caregiver also how to do the procedure, not even standing by side, but we have to uh, like we ca can involve the caregiver also uh, to do the uh, whenever we are doing a procedure so that they can learn and they can provide the best services when they are going home right then so uh, initially when we didn't see the video we we had said that we will use the finger to open the mouth so what we have did in this uh, video we have used two spoons right mm -hmm. two spoons and we have taken the handle of the spoon we have covered it with the gauze right and one spoon with a uh, uh, um, gauze covered ha that handle part will be inserted in the mouth in order to keep it open then from the other uh, second spoon we will cover it with the gauze we will dip it in the saline and then squeeze it so that the extra water will be out and then we will clean the mouth right in a single stroke manner using one cotton your gauze right these are the important things right Next, we will look into care of the eyes. So, contribute your answers. How we will care the eyes? These are all general topics. That's why, that's why I'm asking you to contribute it because uh, contribution will make you more remember things, right? You can remember it, this kind of answer. I have said we got this kind of response where this, nothing is right and wrong. You can contribute your answers. Ma maintaining aseptic okay. techniques while cleaning the eye. Hmm. Okay. So how we will clean the eye? Inner from to inner to outer canthus. Very good. From inner canthus to the outer canthus. Outer canthus. That, that is the point I was looking for. Thank you. Okay. So the care of the mm -hmm. eyes is that is explain the procedure to the patient, provide comfortable position. So the comfortable position, whatever position the patient, but more comfortable will be if we will keep the um, head and elevated, right? So that will be more easy. But if any contraindication is there, we can uh, use the comfortable position, which is indicated for the patient. Then wash the hands, clean the eyelid, eyelashes with the wet swab, wipe the lid from the inner canthus to the outer canthus, and also use one swab for one strong. That is also important point, right? Otherwise, what will happen? The swab which we use from inner to outer, and then again, we are using that swab, then already the infection will be there, and we are, uh, uh, first stroke what we have did will be of no use, right? And also we are uh, providing more uh, exposure to the infection. Right. Then also after that cleaning with a one swab with one stroke documentation. After doing the procedure, we have to document it. Right. Then care of the no. nose and ear. Yeah. Okay. Care of the nose and the ear. How we will care? We will explain the procedure to the patient. Remove any secretions from the nostril. Uh, we have to uh, wet the or uh, wet the washcloth or cotton and then we have to clean it with the normal saline or water. Then uh, check for any dirt accumulated behind and that is the procedure for the nose. Like right? when we are cleaning a nose, we have to just wet the swab and then clean it, right? Then uh, with the single swab only, one nostril, another nostril, single swab. Then uh, if, uh, how we will clean the ear? What all things we have to note in the ear? Dirt accumulation. Is there any dirt accumulation behind the ear? 
yeah from front part of the ear and the back side of the back ear back, back is mm -hmm. the most neglected part right back yes, side of the ear is the most neglected part so what we have to do we have to tell uh, or provide education to the caregiver or we have to do ourselves how we have to clean it by cleaning the ear in the front part and also in the back area because back area more dirt will be accumulated so that has to be cleaned and collection of the wax is there in the ear then that can cause the he uh, hearing problem so we have to refer the patient to the ENT we should not insert anything in the ear that can cause more uh, or cause damage to the ear right so we have to refer it to the ENT right Okay, so this was the procedure for the nose and the ear. Next, we'll care for the hair. How we'll care for the hair? These are not the basic procedure, right? Remember, uh, now you will be remembering or your uh, past days of your uh, basic study or general study, right? Not remembering. I'm remembering it. That's why I have said it. No one in the uh, participants, you are not remembering anything. Yes, flashback is coming, right? What all procedure we used to do it, uh, right? Most yes, frequently we be were in the first year, second year, or third year, right? So, uh, though, so what will, how we will do the care of the hair? Please respond. Uh, who have not responded yet? Baby combing. Yeah, can you please repeat it? Daily combing hair. Daily combing hair. Then making, remove the tangles. Very good. Then check the scalp for the, check the dandruff. Scalp. Yeah. For the dandruff or any other injuries or skin problem. Just assess daily. Very good. Yeah, very good. Then more if we hair are hair. using a full hair care, right? We are bathing the hair and all. So if we are bathing the hair, then what all precautions we have to look into? Yeah, the while bathing the hair, while uh, uh, washing the hair, mm -hmm. make sure both ears are uh, plugged. Ah, uh, yes, or plugged with the, the cotton balls actually. Okay, so make sure good. the water not uh, go into the ear, both ears. Yeah, so you yeah. just cover the ears with the cotton balls. Yeah, thank you. And another thing which we have to consider. And then support uh, all the what uh, surround as, as like, uh, you know, uh, shown in the picture. Just cover everything. Make sure the water drain into the pail down. So you have to do it nicely. <laughs> Yeah. All the oh. papers, uh, you know, this depends on your settings, how you can do that. Make ah. sure the water drain out in a proper way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for your response. So, okay. So care for the hair as it is given in the uh, image also, like we can say that, right? So water, how we will check the, like we'll take the water. Water will be if it depends on the climate, right? So um, basically we will use a lukewarm water uh, for the hair wash or the water which is uh, friendly with the environment or the patient, right? Normally we use a lukewarm water, right? So whenever we clean it, we'll tell the patient to come to the edge of the, uh, keep bring the head towards the edge of the bed, right? Come upward. So so that in the in the ed edge of the bed, the head will be there. We can place a Macintosh. That Macintosh will be guiding towards the bucket. So whatever bucket or the container which is kept inside, that water will be collected, right? So these are the important thing. And if the hair is very uh, like um, heavy, right? So at that time, we can tell them to divide into two parts and then clean from one area, another area, right? Remember, these all things we used to do it, right? So yeah. first of all, whenever we care for a hair, we will explain the procedure to the patient. We will help the patient move his head or uh, his or her head towards the edge of the bed and remove the pillow. Then protect the bed linen and pillow cover with a towel and Macintosh. Okay, then insert the cotton balls to, into the ear in order in order to prevent spilling the water into the ear and then place a Macintosh under the patient's head and neck. Keep one of the edge of the Macintosh into a bucket to receive the dirty water. Then wash thoroughly with the soap or shampoo. Rinse thoroughly and dry the hair. Braid the hair into two or each side of the head. Uh, two on each side of the head and remove the cotton balls from the ear. After the procedure, we can remove it and we can document if any findings are there. 
right and what how much is the temperature of the water we have used it um, or uh, what are the solutions any kind of um, like after the procedure any kind of redness we have noticed in the scalp or not these all things we can write it right then nail care okay so what all things we have to do in the nail care Yeah. Can checking anyone? Any, checking yeah. any accumulation of dirt is there? Any patch on it? Okay. Oh, Explain yeah. the patient. Nail cutter. Yeah. Kidney tray. Yeah. With cotton. Mm -hmm. What if if the um, nails are very hard? Okay. Soaking, so soaking. 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 So we need warm water in order to soak the nails. Okay, so what is the purpose of soaking the nail? The nail will soft. To make soft. To make it soft. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your response. Okay, so nail care, explain the procedure to the patient, assemble the articles, what are needed, uh, like a nail cutter, kidney tray, a water, a bowl in a water, warm water. Okay. Then a gauze also. We have to need it because with the gauze help that we'll collect the nails, uh, cut off nails, right? Then soak the fingers in the warm water for five minutes. Cut the edges, which is very important. We have to cut the edges of the nail. Otherwise, that sharp edges will be uh, getting into another side of the finger and it can hurt it, right? Then encourage the caregiver to provide nail care, right? Then bed bath. Bathing is then very important in maintaining and promoting hygiene, right? So, uh, what are the objectives of providing a ba bed bath? Prevent bed sore, ma'am. Uh, uh, to prevent bed sore, uh, to stimulate circulation, right? To improve the circulation. Yeah. Then clean the body uh -huh. and comfort the patient. Very good. Uh, next. Quite feeling of cleanliness. It get precious uh, means induced still sleep. Very good. Yeah. The patient itself will be having a sense of well-being, right? The patient itself will be having a sense of uh, happiness, mm -hmm. a sense of uh, like what freshness, right? So uh, and also important thing is we can regulate the body temperature. Okay, so we'll look into the objective to clean the dirt from the body, to increase the elimination of waste through the skin, uh, to stimulate circulation, to induce sleep, to provide comfort, to give the patient a sense of well-being and to regulate body temperature, right? So these are all important objectives we have to uh, consider whenever we are doing a bed bath. So what, what, uh, why we are considering these objectives? So after the procedure, we'll ask to the patient, uh, without asking even, the patient will say that after a long, I have taken a bath and I'm feeling very happy, refreshed, right? These kind of um, like words will be from, we will be uh, uh, getting from the patient, right? So bed bath is that much important, equal to the oral care, right? Next. So what is the procedure? Can anyone tell uh, like important points which we have to consider when we are doing a bed bath? Explain the procedure. Okay. Provide privacy. Okay. Anything important thing which we have to uh, like... Um, like we have to explain it or we have to remember it while we are doing a bed bath. Check the temperature. Of the, uh, take the temperature of the water, then. Take Keep the ready all the equipments. Okay. But more important thing, these are all things which we are doing in every procedure. But what is the difference between doing a, some procedure? Like we are doing an oral care with a uh, with, with important two points that the oral care, whenever we are doing it an unconscious patient, we will use two spoons covered with the handles are covered with the gauze in order to prevent the finger bite, right? 
then these are the important things or whenever we are doing a hair care we are dividing the hair into two parts so that it can be more easy to tangle it free right so these are the important things and we are doing a nail care we are soaking the nail care so what difference is there in the bath care uh, sorry bed bath okay so uh, not with wasting much time i'll uh, like to tell that so you have all contributed the point to maintain the privacy to explain the procedure to uh, arrange the equipments which are near to the hand and conveniently placed we have to check the temperature of the water and we have to keep the patient near to the edge of the bed this is important whenever we are caring for the otherwise what will happen patient will be in the other side of the bed we are in this side so what we have to lean down more and that can cause problem to the caregiver itself right so what we will do we will take the uh, we will uh, help the patient to come near to the bed so that we don't have to do any extra leaning down right then also straining uh, uh, in order to avoid straining then only small area of the body should be exposed and bath at the time isn't it this was the answer i was expecting so only small area of the body should be exposed and bath at a time so can anyone explain it means if we are going to we have to clean the arms first after that we have to clean the uh, chest and all without uh, exposing we can when we clean the arms we will cover it soon after cleaning it so we are right. considering the privacy of the patient also right and we are exposing only one part and doing the cleaning okay so that will be also in a single stroke manner only that will be also with like we will not rub it we will just pat it right okay so remove the soap completely from the body to avoid the drying effect and cleaning is done from the cleanest area to the less cleanest area so what is the what what is the cleanest area upper part of the body and less cleanest is the lower part of the body from upper part of the body to the lower we are cleaning it then wash the hand and feet by rinsing them in a bowl of water because it promotes through cleaning of the finger nails and toe nails a thorough inspection of the skin especially at the back of the body should be done to find out early signs of bed so so you have contributed this point so whenever we are doing a bed bath we have to remember that we are doing it from the cleaning from the cleanest area to the less cleanest area that is upper part of the body first doing the cleaning and then towards the lower part and then we have to consider the important point that we have to inspect the back also skin of the back so that uh, like whenever we are doing a back back uh, cleaning we have to see any signs of bed sore are there or not and early early finding of the signs will also be there right then apply moisturizing cream and massage for at least 2 to 3 to 3 to 5 minutes in order to promote circulation right okay so back care okay so back care special attention to the pressure points so uh, what are the pressure points so if it so, is a supine position then pressure points will be different from different different uh, uh, like way of lying down supine it will be different side line it will be different okay so prone it will be different okay so bony prominent areas like uh, like uh, if the patient is in the supine position so the sacral area the buttocks area the heel area you know and uh, the occiput area so these are all the pressure point areas whenever the patient whatever position the patient will be attained if they more than 2 hours of time the 2 hours of time the patient is in a single position that will hamper the circulation right so because of that only we have to change the position right and also we have to especially when we are doing a back care to the patient we have to give special attention to the pressure point area and back care every 2 hours then lather the soap by sponge towel wipe with the soap and rinse with the plain water dry the area by patting not rubbing as i said because when we will rub it the skin will be very soft sensitive so it can break we can break the skin right so we can pat that area and apply moisturizing cream massage at least 3 to 5 minutes and managing uh, massaging help to improve the blood supply to the area and prevent the bed sore right okay this much is clear yes ma'am yes madam yes ma'am 
okay thank you next is active and passive exercise so after this procedure we can promote exercise also active and passive that is we can actively involve a patient by doing himself the active exercises and passive means we will support the patient we will support the patient uh, while doing the exercise then exercise must be integrated into the patient's daily life as it prevents contractures food drop and waste drop so we are doing exercise in order to strengthen that part right so the muscles will because of the muscle weakness it can uh, cause contractures so in order to prevent that we are uh, initiating active and passive exercises then all the joint needs physiotherapy and educate the family the importance of exercise to prevent joint stiffness right so why we are giving active and passive exercises in order to prevent joint stiffness contractures foot drop face drop we will promote active and passive exercises right next we'll come to the catheterization okay so we are all familiar how to do a catheterization procedure right but what are the few important points while we are doing a catheterization so what is cather catheterization placing a urinary catheter inside the urethra okay obviously male patient okay. or male patient Okay, so we are inserting, but we have to consider a sterile procedure. That is very important. Whenever we are doing a catheterization, sterile procedure, and we are inserting a tube, that is Foley's tube, into the urethra, into the urinary, uh, urinary bladder to drain the urine, right? So, uh, so this is the image. Uh, you can see the picture. How it is? It has got two lumen. One is a urine drainage pod, balloon pod. The size is also written in that, in the urine drainage pod area. And also size can be 14, 16, right? Depends. Then, then also bladder opening part is there. There is a hole in that. And also below that, there is a balloony part. So how much is the amount of water we will inflate it? We'll use to inflate it. St uh, distilled water. 15 to 25 10 to 15 20 to 30 10 to 50 ml 15 uh, to 20 ml not more than 10 ml okay not more than 10 ml because if we will uh, uh, inflate more water what will happen the bladder the uh, the balloon which become inflated while uh, movement and all the bladder the that inflated balloon will be causing bladder spasms Okay, so we have, we does not use more water and it, uh, and um, we know that whenever we are using a catheter, there is a risk of infection. Okay, when the time comes uh, uh, high, like uh, uh, one month, two month, three month, like if it is a normal catheter, Foley's catheter, we are using rubber, then that will be only one month. We Every one month we have to remove it. So not more than 10 ml, we have to inflate it. We have to use only uh, like 10 ml. Um, not more than that, so it can cause bladder spasm, right? Okay, there are different types of catheterization, indwelling catheterization, indwelling suprapubic catheterization, clean intermittent self-catheterization and quantum catheterization. So indwelling catheterization is when normally we are doing it. Uh, indwelling suprapubic catheterization, that is we are doing a, a direct hole into the bladder and we are draining the uh, urine. Then clean intermittent self-catheterization. So in this also we can use as the image is given the green and the white one that is intermittent self-catheterization. A single nail cath we will use to drain the urine. Then condom catheterization it is a like we will uh, uh, in the condom uh, catheterization that part will be inserted to the um, um, uh, male, male reproductive area and then the bag will be attached to that. So that will be more used when the night times when the patient is um, cannot go walk and go and go to the toilets, right? So these are the types. Next. Okay, so this is the image, as I said, uh, normal um, uh, yeah, indwelling catheterization and suprapubic tube where it is inserted in the abdomen, there is a small hole is made into the towards the bladder and then a catheter is inserted, right? So what, how will be the procedure? Okay, so we have to follow strict sterile precautions you know, and 
we have to choose the size correct size should be there that is 14 uh, french size 16 18 right then we have to lubricate generously and wait so whenever we are doing a, a male catheterization we will insert the uh, uh, xylopene jelly into the uh, urethras, right? So then we, uh, we will wait for a while and then we will do the procedure. So it is important to ensure that the bulb is in the bladder, right? And also how to inflate it, not more than 10 ml uh, because too much will cause bladder spasm. And also antibiotic prophylaxis because whenever we are using a follis catheter, that is an uh, outside agent, right? No, okay. So that, um, uh, what, what word? Um, what we can say that word, I'm not getting it. Uh, that is, uh, it is considered as a foreign body, right? So foreign body, when we are inserting into the urethra, the body will not accept it immediately, right? So that kind of reaction, the infectious reaction means that um, uh, like it can cause infection because of that. So that will be, we will, uh, after the catheterization, antibiotic prophylaxis can be started, but it is not that uh, recommended for everyone if it, the signs will be there, then immediately the symptoms will be arising. If any risk of infection will be there, the patient will be getting signs, symptoms, right? Fever, shivering, and lower abdominal pain, back pain, these all things will be there. Uh, 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 there will be burning uh, sensation in the urine, right? So these all symptoms will be there. So it is not recommended, but uh, antibiotic prophylaxis can be done after urinary catheterization. Okay, so clean intermittent catheterization, how will we do it? That is the important thing we have to consider is we have to tell the patient to drain the urine with the intermittent catheter every four hourly. That is very important, right? So what the rest of the procedure is same: privacy, hand washing, comfort the patient to the no, uh, level of uh, uh, position to the patient in a comfortable position. Then nail cat size that is very important. Twelve French size. Lubricate the tip before insertion. That is. That is also important. We are doing it. But we have to tell the patient how frequently they have to use the intermittent catheter. That is every four hours. Then clean the nail cat under running water and keep it in a dry clean container. Right? Then advantages. So what are the advantages? So while catheterization, it will improve the quality of life. It will increase the self-esteem and confidence of the patient, easy to use, in, inexpensive, reduce the risk of infection and improve sexual life, right? Condom catheterization. So this is how the condom catheterization is inserted. Then the fixing is very important because whenever the condom catheter is inserted, then the fixing, that, that is the, uh, the micropore which we are using, it should be not, not too tight, not too loose. But because if it is loose, it will come out. And if it will tie, tight, then what will happen? There can be injury will happen. You know? And then that can cause uh, more problems to the patient. So we have to uh, tell the patient, uh, give a proper uh, education to the patient who are using condom catheterization. Okay, so what are the advantages and disadvantages? So we have to consider advantages, less catheter associated in uh, urinary tract infection. Okay, so and uh, what is the advantages which we are more uh, like um, uh, considering? More comfortable than indwelling in catheter. This is advantages which is said as condom. Why condom catheter is more advantages than indwelling catheter, right? So why? Because less catheter associated urinary tract infection. Because when we have to uh, want to use it, we will use it and then we will remove it, right? So it it will be more more in contact with the skin more in uh, more risk of infection because it's a foreign body right then more comfortable than indwelling catheter less movement restriction so if we are using an indwelling catheter the patient will be uh, taking it uh, back everywhere everywhere he is going so that can be uh, uh, patient will be less moving it, right? Because of catheter, indwelling catheter. So we can tell, uh, but in the quantum catheterization, movement restrictions are not there. Non-invasive, nothing is inserted in the body. So what are the disadvantages? So as we know, same as condom, that is a latex is used, you know, that a latex allergy, skin allergy can occur in the while we are using a condom catheter. 
there can be if we, it is not rightly fixed it can cause leakage it can cause um, uh, if it is tightly fixed then it can cause skin irritation and and also it can break the skin and also urine leakage will be there right so these are things we have to consider when we are using a condom uh, suggesting a patient when they are to use a condom catheter right okay so there is a case scenario i would like to uh, um, like some uh, anyone from the your end from the participant can read the case scenario anyone voluntarily anyone No one care unit of the hospital made a visit and found that the patient was having very catheter leak. So they changed the catheter. The next day, the carrier, carrier noticed that the peri catheter leak was still persisting. She called them again. They came and changed the catheter. Again, the next day, the same happened. The ones Again, the catheter was changed. The catheter was changed three times, but the problem did not resolve. Why this problem didn't resolve? Because of the exact size of that. Yeah, okay. That That is the one point right. then. Any other? because of the improper size. So we have to choose the correct size whenever we are doing a catheterization then. Infection can cause leakage. Bacteria. Bacteria in them. Ah, bacterial infection can cause? Into the body. Yeah. Bacteria in the Okay, then? The balloon problem with the balloon. Very the balloon. good. Or the inflated balloon. If we are exceeding more than 10 ml or if we are in, uh, using 20 ml. So over inflation yeah. of the balloon can also cause uh, leakage. Right. So these are the three things that is any kind of infection can cause leakage. Uh, if we are not using a proper size of the catheter and we are uh, inflating the balloon in more using more distal water like more than 15 ml then that can cause leakage right or and one more thing uh, we can consider okay these are the th three things next we will come to bladder care so bladder care is catheter should be changed every three weeks to one month so if it is a cellular rubber normal rubber then within one month or if it is a silicone then we can use it for uh, uh, i think it's three months Okay, then provide perineal care and keep the Eurobag cap always closed and below the waist level. This is also very important when we are using, uh, when the patient is catheterized, we have to use uh, the, the bag should be below the waist level, right? In order to drain the urine. Then empty the bag if it is three-fourth the full. And intake should be, whenever we are doing a, a procedure to the catheterization, after that we have to promote or we have to educate the patient to take in uh, fluids, right? Uh, at least 2.5 to, to 3 liters in 24 hours and observe urine if is draining freely. Any color changes that has to be reported, any kind of risk uh, infectious sign is there that has to be reported. If patients is showing any symptoms of infection, that has to be reported and then encourage the patient for daily bowel movement, right? Care of the perineum. So whenever we are doing a perineal care, perineum should be cleaned after each act of urination and defecation. Uh, clean with the soap and water daily three to four times and keep the area dry and clean from the cleanest to the less cleanest area. Hands should be cleaned after giving perineal care. Next is bowel care. Bowel care in a uh, bedridden patient. Patient due to lack of exercise, privacy and reduced fluid intake, medication, it can cause constipation, right? So whenever the patient is uh, bedridden, he is not moving 
he is not doing any kind of exercise um, no like because of um, uh, privacy lack of privacy because of reduced intake of uh, intake of food and also because of a side effect of the medication uh, that can cause constipation then encourage the patient for bowel movement daily we have to tell them to take intake of uh, more fluids and diet will promote the bowel movement then give the time for the bowel movement we'll tell the patient you know na the, because of the disease condition the patient is already irritated he will go, he will feel the urge to go he will go sit in the toilet and within 5 minutes if it doesn't happen what will he will do come back he will not go and he will say i am not i am having problem he'll get more irritated right so we have to tell them that give time for the bowel movement wait for at least 5 to 10 minutes give time for the bowel movement right then patient should be encouraged to take high fiber diet adequate fluid intake high fiber diet to promote bowel movement we will tell them to we will suggest them to take high fiber diet so anyone can suggest what are the high fiber diets please contribute your points high fiber diet oats cereals mm -hmm. wheat wheat okay vegetable okay pineapple orange orange okay okay we will suggest the high fiber diets then also adequate diet intake then encourage regular exercise we will provide if it's a bedridden patient also we will tell them to uh, uh, like uh, uh, hand moving and uh, changing the position everything that movement will promote the bowel movement right so we can do uh, bowel care like this then bowel care use of a bedpan it is mandatory to maintain patient's privacy privacy use of a commode or a lavatory for defecation if if it is spurious diarrhea um, any idea about spurious diarrhea yeah I I want no, ma'am. Already the topic is completed, right? Serious diarrhea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, semi liquid stool. Okay. Okay. Spurious diarrhea. If the patient is having in the palliative setting, whenever the patient is using opioids. Okay. So there is a side effect that is constipation. Huh? So when the when the patient will be coming with a complaint that he is having a loose stool. Okay. So that is because the impacted fecal will be uh, the hard fecal will be retained inside and from the side there will be leakage of the fluid. So that fluid will be leaking like a loose stool. Right. The constipation associated with diarrhea so that is uh, like if the patient is having continuous constipation and then suddenly the patient is complaining that he is having a loose stool that is the liquids are coming down without any content so that will uh, be considered as spurious diarrhea and we have to ask the history when it started uh, and the on before the onset what was the condition of the patient right so in order to uh, uh, like in order to identify that it is a spurious diarrhea we can do as a management we have to uh, do the uh, per rectal examination then dr digital removal or manual evacuation of the stool and then high uh, high up enema we have to give high up enema how we will give through a catheter right with the catheter we will lubricate it we will insert it and we will put the enema that enema will be fixed at the catheter end right so uh, that is um, uh, nail cap will be used in that right sorry suction catheter sorry i am very sorry suction catheter is used in the high up enema right so that catheter will be lubricated and that will be inserted and then enema will be given next okay so next is nasogastric tube feeding so where uh, can anyone uh, from your point can add how we will insert or how, how we will measure the nasogastric tube while insertion we will measure the nasogastric tube right so how how it is measured from nose to ear lobe nose to ear lobe towards 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 uh, ear lobe the forward process right 
Remember, rhyphoid process. Rhyphoid process from the nose to the earlobe to the rhyphoid process. So it is a process of feeding with a uh, tube inserted from the nose towards the pharynx, towards the esophagus, and towards the nose. Right. So this is the procedure of a nasogastric tube feeding. So how we will care of a patient with uh, NG tube, uh, Riles tube or nasogastric tube. So we have to perform hand hygiene, give follow-up position or sepin follow-up position before feeding. And we have to prevent air entry in the tube by pinching it. This is very important point. Whenever we are feeding the patient with the Riles tube, we have to prevent the air entry. Then aspirate and make sure that the tube is in the stomach. If more than 50 ml, skip the feed. Then food item is thoroughly grinded and filtered. Why we are grinding and filtering the food item? To prevent aspiration. Some patients will aspirate suddenly. Okay, so first thing we have to remember that whenever we feed a, um, like, um, if we are not grinding the food material, it will first, what it will do? It will obstruct the tube. It will block the tube, right? So in order to prevent the uh, blockage, we will use the fine particle, grinded particles into the tube, right? And every two hourly, we have to give how much feeding? 200 to 250 ml and each feed we can give uh, before and after we can give 25, 25 ml of plain water. 25 ml plain water before and after the feeding, then after that, right? Then keep the patient same position for at least 30 minutes. Why are you keeping the patient into the, in the same position for at least 30 minutes? Yeah. To avoid regurgitation or aspiration. Very good. To avoid regurgitation and aspiration, we will prevent, uh, keep the patient in the same position for 30 minutes, half an hour, right? Then provide oral care and keep the lips moist and change the adhesive periodically to prevent ulcer formation. So we have to fix that uh, Riles tube towards the nose, right? So whenever we are fixing it in order to prevent uh, uh, out outflow, what we have to, we have to give whenever we are doing the care of, uh, whenever we are feeding the patient with the uh, Riles tube, we have to change the adhesive tapes also. While it is fixed to the nose, it can cause skin infection, right? So, or skin ulcer. So in order to prevent that, we have to change the adhesive periodically. Okay, so we will now see the video of a catheter care, how to do a catheter care and what are the important points we have to remember. Catheter care in males. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. This was the uh, basic nursing issues uh, which we have discussed today. So we have discussed the principles, we have discussed the head-to-toe care and also important points whenever we are doing a particular care, right? So um, I would like to ask one, one more thing. Uh, while seeing the video, uh, what are the take-home messages you have seen in the catheterization video? Important, important, only important points. To replace the uh, first kill, the male patients. Okay. And uh, again, use the sterilized house, no? Uh, with the normal saline. After cleaning the may, may, catheter sites, uh -huh. and they use some clean cloth with sterile gloves. Okay. I have noticed that. Here. Okay. Okay, that is why wearing the sterile, uh, that, that is whatever cleaned part we have cleaned it, we will protect it with the sterile gauze. Then we will uh, do the procedure, mm -hmm. right? Then, then anything else? And ma'am, ma'am, other thing is, can we use some betadine solution or something? Uh, betadine, uh, uh, like, um, yeah, we can use a diluted betadine solution to clean the yes, perineal the area. Yes. Yeah, before yes. the procedure, we can clean it while doing the insertion. That is, uh, uh, betadine is not needed. When we have to clean the perineal area, we can use it with the, uh, uh, like, diluted betadine solution. What about aqueous uh, solution, you. madam? Huh? What about aqueous solution? Aqueous. Aqueous. Uh, Aqueous means water, water, right? Uh, not water, it's kind of soap also. No, not needed. What we yeah. are using actually in the usual setting in our, in Malaysia, we are usually in we which use area? That. In which area? And for the perennial care. Um, where, where place you can uh, name the place uh, you belong to? 
uh, like cleaning labia majora before catheterization so uh, uh, for or, this answer i would like yeah i would like to uh, like uh, request shiba ma'am to give the response yeah so thank you snail uh, uh, for the taking a wonderful session it was a, a nice interactive session uh, so uh, ma'am uh, you were asking about the aqua solution uh, you can use that aqua solution for uh, uh, clean the perineal area not cleaning the cadita you can clean uh -huh. the end of perineal area with aqua solution soap and water we are also encourage the patient to use soap and water uh, for cleaning uh, the perineal part uh, but if you clean the cadita uh, please use normal saline or uh, diluted beta because uh, that uh, might be that the uh, catheter uh, goes inside so there will be a chance of the creating urinary tract infection so you can use that except for a uh, catheter cleaning okay thank you noted thank you thank you ma'am Okay, uh, so the session is complete. I would like to uh, end the section and hand over it to Shiba ma'am. Thank you. Uh, any any other questions? Any any last minute question? It was a detailed session. I hope uh, it was clear to everyone. Uh, so one thing you have to remember always. Uh, within the hospital, we are there to help the patient uh, when they go home. Uh, who will take care of the patient? Uh, the caregiver is the uh, main uh, person to take care of the bedbound patient. So it's our duty to train the caregivers before sending to home. So because uh, they be, uh, now we understand that for a bedbound patient, lot of problems will be developed, like uh, um, bed sore. Uh, for a bedbound patient, they need to change the bed sheets. But uh, we all know that how to change a, uh, the bed sheet and how to spread a new bed sheets. But the caregivers doesn't know. What you can do is you have to demonstrate how to change. Then they will follow your instructions. Okay, so that is very, very important. And uh, another thing uh, is uh, uh, spurious diarrhea. But all uh, that uh, other all things, uh, Snegla, the sister was uh, explained very well. I would like to highlight once again about uh, high, uh, that uh, spurious diarrhea um, that is uh, undiagnosed and uh, not treated well because most of the bedbound patients can develop spurious diarrhea. Uh, after a period of constipation, the patient caregivers might be reporting to you. Uh, he or she was started uh, passing loose stool. So uh, what you can be always suspect like, okay, maybe because diarrhea, maybe diarrhea is there. So not because uh, not <clears throat> that the diarrhea. So you have to uh, take a proper history, uh, proper bubble ban bubble movement history. Then you have you can get an idea about uh, the uh, bubble movement and all. Then you can do what you can do is you can do the PRE and find out whether the patient is having any uh, that uh, fecal ma that uh, fecal matter is in impacted fecal stool fecal uh, matter into the, into the rectum, that all things. Usually, uh, if the patient is having uh, that uh, spurious diarrhea, uh, the fecal matter is obstructed in the higher bowel. So that time, if you do the PRE, you, can, you cannot be able to touch the rectal mucosa. Usually, uh, if you do the PRE, usually for a normal person, you can able to touch the rectal mucosa. But if the patient is having um, that uh, spurious area, you 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 will feel like a balloon erect, balloon issue. So that is one uh, indication of spurious area. So you have you, what you can do is you can insert a as uh, Snagaladam said, you can insert a suction catheter and 
uh, as much as possible you can introduce our idea is is to uh, that uh, insert a sodium phosphate enema as much as possible in the beginning then for, from there uh, the sodium phosphate enema will act okay so you can push to phos phos sodium phosphate enema at that time so that um, maybe within 10 to 20 minutes uh, the patient will start the pass motion so that way we can able to manage uh, the spurious diarrhea so and uh, other important uh, one other important point i would like to mention here is uh, aspiration pneumonia most of the bedmont patient who are having uh, nasogastric tube feeding the patient that patients most of the time will get aspiration pneumonia why the patient is getting uh, aspiration pneumonia that all things we have to educate the patient caregivers because when we insert an asophagic tube, the gastroesophageal sphincter is always opened. Okay, when the patient is regurgitated, that easily the foot matches goes into the trachea, and the, because, because of that, the patients will get aspiration pneumonia. So, positioning before feeding and after feeding, feeding the semi fowler's position is very, very important. You have to tell the caregivers this is important. If the if you after feeding, if you keep the patient in supine position, definitely the patient will regurgitate and develop aspiration pneumonia. So that important point you have to tell the caregivers about uh, nasogastric tube feeding. Okay, thank you. Uh, all other points. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you, uh, Snegalada, uh, for a wonderful session. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you, others for. Uh, make this session is very interactive. Thank you.